Part 2 Battle Tendency is a complete and total roller coaster that is 25% longer, 50% more naked, and 100% weirder than Phantom Blood, but did I think it was any better? You see, Battle Tendency, which largely focuses on the story of Jonathan Joestar's grandson Joseph, is the final part I'm vaguely familiar with. In the same vein as the prior part, my memory concerning the events of Battle Tendency were foggy to say the least, with really the only things I remembered being the Pillar Men, a minecart, and my personal favourite Jojo so far, Joseph Joestar, as he uses his Indiana Jones, Hammond, and Sherlock Holmes powers to beat the living daylights out of Nazis and magical naked monsters. So, you know, just a typical day in the office for Araki. Speaking of which, once again I'll be reading the manga for the purposes of this review so as to get as close as possible to the original author's vision. And so, without further ado, I'm Totally Not Mark and this is my review for the ambitious, hilarious, and ridiculous Battle Tendency. Like a bloody storm, I took you like a bloody stone. Ketsuya kuni kizamale ta inen ni. Uki aru kiena iokori no kizuna. Nigirishimete. Years after the events of Phantom Blood, the grandson of Jonathan Joestar, Joseph, now living in New York City, USA, has to travel to Mexico and Europe to overcome the forces of the Pillar Men, a new, more powerful force of evil that makes the vampires from the previous part look like cockroaches by comparison. After defeating the first of four Pillar Men in Mexico through clever tactics, Joseph soon realizes that he must train to hone his abilities with his new best friend forever, Caesar, grandson of Will Antonio Zeppeli. Together they hunt down an individual called Lisa Lisa and undergo some brutal training. However, before his training is completed, Jojo is attacked by a pillar man going by the name of ACDC, who despite <laughs> being much stronger than the pillar man from Mexico, is eventually overcome by Jojo's new abilities. Forces lead the Jojo gang to Switzerland, where his companion dies tragically, leaving just he and Lisa Lisa to take on the remaining forces of Wham and Cars, the two remaining pillar men. Oh, the humanity! <laughs> So, this video was a little harder to make. You know the way that Phantom Blood was pretty simple in terms of its story? Two boys grew up together, one good, one bad, and somewhere in there, the bad guy puts on a demon vampire zombie mask to make himself an immortal lord of the underworld while the good guy does some breathing karate to stop him. You know, like I said, a simple story. Well, this one is a lot more complicated. You got the grandson of Jonathan, the Joseph Joestar character, living with his grandma Irina and good friends with Speedwagon, who is also an oil tycoon that goes to Mexico to see a large naked man in a stone pillar, but gets captured by the Nazis who want to do experiments on the naked pillar man, and once Joseph finds out about this, he gets angry and hops in a motorcycle before fighting a cape in the middle of the desert using only a cactus. And that's just half of the first volume, and there are four volumes! Okay, jokes aside, I actually loved this story, and I think it's more effective as an arc than Phantom Blood in almost every conceivable way. And it does so by standing on the shoulders of the various characters and mechanics Phantom Blood's already established. And I realize this almost immediately because Battle Tendency starts fast. And I say fast not because the scenes go by at any unreasonable pace, but because the contents of these scenes are intensely compelling. For me, there were some very easily recognizable differences with how Battle Tendency was told compared with Phantom Blood. I very much enjoyed Phantom Blood for what it was, but one thing I thought it could have done more with was scene diversity. You'll notice in Phantom Blood, outside of a scene here and there towards the beginning, the entire plot takes place in one story thread. Whereas in Battle Tendency, the first act very much tells multiple stories before converging in on one towards the second act. That helped tremendously with pacing issues that often arise in that section. However, while that difference is greatly appreciated, one act aspect I think almost everyone noticed that elevated the story beyond all others was Joseph Joestar. Joe is Bay. Even if you rewound the clock back to when I first saw the anime all those years ago, despite my initial time being bad, Joseph Joestar was always a bright spot in that series for me. Of the three Jojos I had been introduced to during that time, he was head and shoulders better than all of the others for me, or at least I was more receptive to him more than anyone else. Whether or not that will stand true to Jotaro next week is another 
another question now that I'll be tackling the manga instead of the anime. But for the time being, little 195 centimeter tall Joey Joestar is a tremendously go? engaging character to me. Similarly to how Jonathan was introduced in Phantom Blood, Joseph's introductory scene offers up a lot of information about who he is as a character, and I think this is something Araki has done phenomenally well in the past as well as here. In his 2015 book, Manga in Theory and Practice, Araki spends a considerable amount of time expanding upon and delving into his process when it comes to writing a particular character, creating spreadsheets of common attributes like their height, weight, and birthday, but also traits that might be a little bit more obscure, like criminal records, dreams, fears, relationship histories, and whether or not they are or are not colorblind? And there are tons of other elements that go into making his character spreadsheets. And this aspect of his craft in particular, I think is something he improved upon greatly between parts one and two personally. While I liked Jonathan's introductory scene where he intervenes with some bullies, his less important scenes thereafter felt less compelling and somewhat disconnected from the initial introduction we experienced, or at least that's how I felt. And while pivotal moments dotted throughout shared the same characteristics as the first, I think Jonathan stands in great contrast to what Araki managed to create with Joseph Joestar, his grandson. Because I adored part two's introductory chapter concerning Joseph Joestar. Not just because it establishes a clear tone for the character that he adheres to religiously throughout, but also because he fulfills another principle he preaches in his book that I love. The four pillars of manga structure. In his book, he describes these four fundamental pillars as being characters, story, setting, and themes. And it's his implementation of these four fundamentals that made this story so compelling for me to read through. He says, when creating a manga, it is incredibly important not to simply draw on a whim, but to be conscious of the four fundamental elements as you draw. Am I making good characters? Is my story acceptable? Am I drawing a coherent setting? Are my themes consistent and steady? And with that quote in mind, you'll notice that in Joseph Joestar's introductory scene, it takes care of all of these qualities while also helping us form a clear understanding of who Joe is as a character. Joseph Joestar. Unlike Phantom Blood, which begins with an expository scene alongside the villain circumstances, this part launches off the heels of Joseph Joestar's introductory chapter. The vast majority of this chapter is dedicated to him and with great reason as we soon will find out. Right off the bat, it's clear that the story is taking place in a time period far removed from late 19th century England, old fashioned cars zooming past, Statue of Liberty piercing the sky, and a Coca-Cola vendor on the street selling drinks from his stall. Even the clothes people are wearing, all of this helps set the scene for the adventure that this story enjoys. Faced with the situation of being mugged, he notices the boy who did the mugging being taken advantage of and bullied by the cops that catch him soon after the act. Instead of taking the mugging personally, Joseph can recognize when someone is in trouble and vouches for the kid before getting ticked off by the policeman and introducing us to his level of ham incompetency. And with this brief scene, we learn everything we need to know about Joseph. He's virtuous and kind, but also quick to temper, but perhaps the defining characteristic Joseph Joestar demonstrates and sets him apart from most of the others is that of his intellect. Coming up with an excuse for the young kid on the fly is just the first taste of what Joseph is capable of doing once he puts his mind to something. As we will soon see in almost every single fight scene that takes place after this. And what I just said there is why for me Joseph is a terrific main character. He drives the plot, has a terrific aura of charisma, but more than that he's a consistent personality. By the end of this story I'd spend so much time with Joseph that I honestly felt like I knew him, which, while I'm not trying to knock Jonathan, is certainly not what I can say about him personally. And this familiarity that I'm feeling as a reader can be leveraged by the author too, but more on that in a little while. Secondary Characters if there was one thing I thought Jojo's Bizarre Adventure lacked in part one, it was interesting or compelling secondary characters. The young friends Jonathan had, his father, the police, and even Zeppeli to a large extent lacked specific elements that prevented them from being compelling within the story. Though I will say Zeppeli is easily the most well-realized side character in part one, but even in saying that, he isn't around for very long, and when he does pass on, it didn't really affect me in any strong or appreciable way. I mean, if one of your three strongest supporters characters after Speedwagon and Zeppeli is a dog with no speaking lines, it makes you wonder if something might be amiss here. With that said, however, secondary characters in Battle Tendency play a significantly larger role, with the connection I felt to those characters feeling far more potent than the story that came before it. But something I think is worth noting, as I mentioned towards the beginning of this video, Battle Tendency is fantastic, but it is helped tremendously by legwork Phantom Blood has done to establish characters like Stray 
Streets, Speedwagon, and the Zeppeli family line, as all of these characters are either directly present in the story to elevate the existing main character, Joseph, or their effects are present to affect their lineage. And I think it's important to mention the side characters here because the side characters in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure actually carry most of the emotional weight from story to story, or at least early on. As far as I'm aware, given my limited exposure to the series, each new part boasts a new main character, and so when that new guy shows up and is in the process of winning us the audience over, we can still feel a connection to this new material despite the old main character having taken a backseat because we still have a connection to the familiar faces we see on the sidelines. I was delighted to see Speedwagon and even Straits in this story. And so in addition to erasing the need for expository dialogue dumps explaining who all these characters are, we can instead focus on the plot which is made all the more streamlined thanks to these individuals. And by the way, the pacing in this part is amazing. At no point was I even remotely bored, there's always something to be looking forward to or immediately happening. Straits, whom we met in the very first part for example, is still kicking around with Speedwagon. It's awesome to see familiar faces and, well, okay, sort of. It's been 50 years and Speedwagon looks much older, however Straits only looks marginally different thanks to the Hamon he's mastered to help him retain some of his youth. And despite him being a character that fought on the side of good prior, this character in Straits is used as the first minor antagonistic force in the story and one for Joseph to really demonstrate where his strengths lie and where his weaknesses are. Having gone to Mexico with Speedwagon to investigate some ruins, Straits ends up taking out everyone including Speedwagon, seizing the opportunity to wear the mask and transform into a vampire. Returning to New York where Jojo is to confront him, this is the first main fight of the story and one that pits our hero against one of the main monsters from the last part. And this all takes place in the first few chapters. The pacing in this story is honestly nuts with the fight that ensues being even better. The fight scenes. There are two sections of fight scenes in this story, or at least two that I recognize. The pre-training arc fights and the post-training arc fights. And both are great for different reasons, so let's take a look at the pre-training arc stuff first, starting with the first major battle Joseph has in the series with the newly young and vampiric Straits. Straits versus Joseph Joestar. I won't harp on about it for too long, but this is probably the most perfect a first fight could be for a series like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, but more specifically for battle tendency. Similarly to the encounter with the policeman we get with Joseph in the first chapter, this fight reinforces everything we've learned to be true and consistent with the character of Joseph in far more obvious ways. One aspect I didn't much care for beyond a few interesting set pieces in Phantom Blood was the nature of its action. While I didn't feel it was bad, I certainly didn't feel like it had any significant connection to the character of Jonathan. But if there's one thing I can't fault Battle Tendency for, it's failing to be memorable. Joseph pulling a Tommy gun out of thin air, throwing a grenade at him only for Straits to realize that the grenade that he threw back at Jojo was attached to many other grenades on his back, all certainly elevate the level of absurdity this story bathes luxuriously in. There's an almost slapstick comedic quality that accompanies this section along with the intrigue that's obviously there as we see Joseph learn more and more about the world he's entering into. In this fight, it becomes apparent that what sets Joseph apart isn't his use of Hammond, his physical prowess, or his personality even. Instead, it's his intellect. His ability to deconstruct problems on the fly and come up with more and more abstract solutions to help him achieve victory in ludicrously absurd ways. Santana vs. Joseph Josta. I think of all the action sequences in this first half, this one was probably my favorite. There was a fantastic element of mystery to it, the setting being that of a secret military World War II bunker conducting experiments on the otherworldly being as it time and time again demonstrates that it's far behind the understanding of anything they have anticipated. With the creature known as Santana demonstrating to us what exactly it was capable of when it took out the vampire enemy that gave our heroes so much trouble to deal with back in Phantom Blood, and it does so with ease. Elevating this scene further is a German soldier higher up from the late 1930s whose allegiance I am specifically trying to avoid saying lest I get struck down by the demonetization gods of YouTube. His name is Stroheim and he is likable, I think? Well, at least not at first. After capturing Speedwagon, who's alive by the way, and after dealing with the disaster this experiment turned out to be, Joseph arrives in the nick of time to save the day, and 
well, okay, sort of. He's there to save Speedwagon and really has no qualms with Santana initially, but eventually things elevate to a considerable degree. And despite the sinister elements that make up this fight, it's actually really exciting and not dark at all. In fact, it's kind of lighthearted. Pun definitely intended with that one. In essence, this fight acts as exposition done right. We learn a great deal about who the Pillar Men are, what they can do, and what's their weakness, sunlight. And in addition to Jojo utilizing his intellect in creative ways once again to gain the upper hand, Stroheim makes a tenacious play that allows the sunlight to pour onto the weakened Santana. One down, three to go. Pillarman vs Caesar and Joseph Joestar. It's during the lead up to this section that the main groundwork set up for the supporting cast is beginning to take shape. Joseph and Speedwagon travel to Rome to meet a descendant of Zeppeli, and his name is Caesar! The relationship Jojo establishes with Caesar is the closest thing this arc gets to compelling, emotional, and memorable character writing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I adore Jojo and Caesar's blossoming bromance as they overcome the various challenges that sprout up before them. Caesar Zeppeli has a clearly defined character which is enjoyable and early on acts as a terrific foil for Jojo to bounce off of. He's tremendously adept with Hammond mastery and so for the short term, immediately after meeting, represents a goal for Jojo to reach for and something for us the audience to latch onto for Jojo. Soon after, the fights that take place with the Pillar Men are fittingly ominous at first, insinuating the pecking order of the monsters Wham, ACDC, and Cars. The two fights that take place concerning Caesar and Jojo versus the Pillar Men are both great at highlighting and serving the Jojo character and what sets him apart from pretty much any other qualified person in this instance. It's not his Hammond, it's his grit and intelligence, the same attributes that gave him the edge in every fight that he's taken part in. The fact that he's besting people, utilizing his unique characteristics make us feel all the more invested and connected to what's transpiring on screen. We understand and recognize that this is the element of his personality that works for him in fights, and if this particular element to his character is overcome, we know that he doesn't really have much else up his sleeve. Hmm? Not just a hat rack, my friend. <laughs> One drawback to this encounter is that it very clearly, at least for me, is there to serve as exposition for the Pillar Man. Now, I praised the previous fight for doing it right, so what did this one do wrong? Normally, this would be fine, considering it also acts as a springboard for the story to launch into a JoJo training arc, but because the Pillar Men consistently remind us of what their motivations are through dialogue to get the ruby, to conquer the day, etc., this being reiterated over and over stood out to me at times as clunky story. Storytelling. It's only a small thing, but it's something I thought was worth mentioning. Moving on, I actually really like the fact that Jojo had to bluff his way out of the fight with the Pillar Men. This is a callback to the gambling contest with Caesar he shared with him in the scene before. He wanted to prove to Caesar that he was the better of the two, and right as the fight ends, despite his trachea and heart being tied up in poisonous rings, he managed to show Caesar his chops and impressed him. One other clear advantage to this particular scene is that it establishes a time limit of 30 days to defeat the Pillar Men before the poisonous rings kill him and they achieve their goal. The training arc. Caesar introduces Jojo to this character. Her name is Lisa Lisa, and Lisa Lisa will train Jojo by placing a mask on him to control his breathing. No one cared who I was till I put on the mask. He has demonstrated in the past that he is quick to action, starts strong, and then gets tired. This will help him control his breathing. Everything that's happened before this was great, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I love training arcs. And now that there's a time limit, a sensei to teach him how to get stronger, and a clear goal, things started to become all the more focused, and I really enjoyed that element of it. Training part one. The Hell Climb Pillar. The Hell Climb Pillar is a massive hole coated in oil and they need to climb out of this thing using only their hammond. And it's simple and easy to understand tasks like this that I knew would again highlight the resourcefulness and tenacity of Joseph's character. And by the way, I'm aware I'm bringing up his character consistency a lot, but really this is what the story is constantly in service of largely with a lot of its scenes. They are designed to have Joey Joestar bounce off the surrounding cast or environment in an effort to reinforce himself and to bring forth conflict. In this particular challenge, Caesar is clearly more advanced, but once again, Jojo's best performance comes when he's thinking abstractly. However, Lisa Lisa puts a stop to that behavior. Jojo is now in a predicament where he can't think his way out of this. He simply must think linearly and overcome this hurdle the way it was designed to be overcome. I love this scene not just because of the philosophy that it employs, but also because Jojo manages to overcome this particular trial by adhering to the rules while also applying abstract thought to overcome the problems that the challenge presents thereafter, leading him to completing this trial in a manner no one has performed 
form before with the help of Caesar too. Caesar's a good boy. Okay, so it's around this time I start to feel like there are small problems with the story, so don't hate me, okay? Oh, excuse me? Lisa Lisa is a cool character, but don't like that she wants to keep the Super Aya Stone safe without understanding why it's important to keep it safe. She just says it's because legend says. There are clearly understood advantages to destroying it here and now, with no known reason to keep it in her possession. It is the one thing that allows the Pillar Men to complete their plan, and I really, for the life of me, don't understand why it's important to keep it around besides to prolong the story. Okay, that's one bad thing. Okay, now time to move on to something good. Jojo moves to complete his last trial and defeat Loggins, his trainer, but but instead finds him dead and the Pillarmen ACDC there. It is a fantastic fight that honestly would feel so strange in any other context, but it works so well as a JoJo fight. And might I say, making your audience anticipate a training sequence only to be met with a surprise boss battle against one of the strongest characters in the arc was a brilliant move by Araki. The fight itself takes place on a spike-filled arena and employs some clever tactics on behalf of Joey Joestar that honestly bordered on the line of lunacy and absurdity more more than a few times. I mean, he uses a string from his hat, but also ties other string in a specific way as a decoy, all in a few split seconds that we don't see, but we'll see afterwards. I'm honestly not sure if I like it that much from a narrative point of view, but I'll chalk it down as a silly fight that was really fun because it was. It was a really fun fight. In this battle, Joseph finally overcomes ACDC and wipes him out. Jojo's training is complete. <gasps> Retrieve the package. Okay, so I really, really didn't like this specific section that follows after JoJo's fight with ACDC. All right, so ACDC is, spoilers, still alive, kinda, and possesses Lisa Lisa's assistant, Susie Q, who then takes the redstone and ships it to Switzerland, and only after defeating ACDC inside Susie Q, does Lisa Lisa perform Hammond Hypnosis and reveals that it was in fact sent to Switzerland, uh, Okay, now, maybe I'm missing something here, but that feels insufferably contrived. At no point was I made aware that Hammond Hypnosis could ever be a thing. Or maybe I just forgot, it's totally possible, but this, when I was reading it, hit me as an action that exists for the sole purpose of moving the plot forward and getting the gang to Switzerland. Which, you know, it's a fine motivation for a scene, but it shouldn't be the only thing that informs it. If you want to do something like Hammond Hypnosis, foreshadow it. Okay. So the evil German bad guys arrive at the train to grab the package before Jojo and co, but for some reason the gang don't take it by force? Despite not having any reason not to just take it from the Germans, who they have no reason to suspect are anything other than human at this point, they instead resign themselves to the idea that it's fine for the stone to be in the hands of anyone else other than the Pillar Men. And immediately in the next scene it's revealed that Stroheim, the tenacious German soldier from the start, is back with cyborg enhancements and begins to school on cars once he starts attacking. He's got a Gatling gun! in his sternum. It's here I realized that Jojo and Co. didn't attack the soldiers because of whatever reason they said, but it's more so because they wanted to have this scene where Stroheim unveils his abilities in front of Kars and not in front of Jojo. Kars takes out Stroheim, but the stone goes flying over a cliff. Jojo and Kars dive after it, but thanks to some quick thinking on behalf of Jojo and some clutch teamwork on behalf of Caesar, the two survive while also taking the stone home. Thankfully, on top of now having the stone and creating distance between themselves and the Pillar Men, they now not only have the stone, they now also know where the stone was going. And thus, the hideout in Switzerland of Wham and Cars comes into focus. Death. Death is a ubiquitous consequence in storytelling these days, and sometimes it's used to great effect. With that said, in part one of Jojo, I didn't feel particularly attached to any one character, save for perhaps Jonathan at the very end. And even then, it certainly wasn't enough to invoke an emotional response from me in any sort of meaningful way. I cared about Jonathan's dog, but not enough to dwell in it for long. I couldn't care less about any of the mansion fight's casualties, particularly Jonathan's father, and despite Zeppeli being handled with far greater care than any other supporting character up until this point, when he did eventually die, I still didn't feel too much for him. However, I cannot say that Battle Tendency suffered that same fate. While I still didn't feel a particular connection to the vast majority of the side characters, there was one that stood head and shoulders above all the others that came before him, both in this part and the prior. Caesar Zeppeli. 
Unlike his grandfather, whom we saw share the screen and pages with Jonathan all those years ago happily, Caesar and Jonathan's relationship has shown one thing that most other relationships in this series have failed to recognize so far, change and development over time. Coming into contact with Joseph at around the same point in the story as William Zeppeli did with Jonathan in and around the halfway point, we see upon first meeting Caesar and Joseph being two brash and confident personalities who would clash on many occasions. And while I found their dynamic to be massively entertaining, it also provided a launching off point for the relationship arc to flourish. Over the course of many fights, trials, and tribulations, Jojo and Caesar always, despite their disagreements, had each other's backs, with Caesar in particular there to catch Jojo whenever he would fall. Then, this happens. Caesar! Alone, the young Caesar Zeppeli fell to the power of Wham in a hard-fought battle. The framing and panelling throughout this story has been of a high standard, but this section here in particular, it's clear there was a lot of attention given to it. The details of when Caesar fought, is slain, and ultimately discovered by Lisa Lisa and Joseph thereafter are all fittingly evocative of the emotion they wish to capture. And somewhat ironically, Jojo has spent the duration of this arc trying to better himself as a fighter, to not blindly charge into battle on some emotional whim. And while he does achieve that throughout the duration, of this tale, Caesar unfortunately makes that very same mistake and pays for it. It's a terrific scene and it's probably for me the most memorable moment in all of the story, save for perhaps one moment that follows soon after. The Final Battle Proceeding into the final volume of this part was honestly a thrilling experience. The framing of the coming scenes, both from a panelling perspective and a narrative one, had me in a knot of nerves. Building to and clearly demonstrating Lisa Lisa as a master of Hammond not only created anticipation for her performance later, but it also presented the writer an opportunity to reveal that, through Lisa Lisa's mastery of Hammond, the entire ceiling of the building they entered is covered in vampires to defeat. This, more than any other, is Lisa Lisa's scene to steal. She negotiates the terms of the fight, demonstrates her abilities, and overall takes the reins on this occasion. She will fight Cars, and Jojo will fight Wham. Oh, also, Lisa Lisa's got like a complicated past that's linked closely with Joseph's family. She's 50 and, oh look, vampire horses! The Joseph Joser versus Wham battle is fun as all hell, but really the moment that stood out to me the most was when Joseph fastens Caesar's Hachimaki onto his head. It's short, but it's a quiet moment signifying that Caesar will be fighting with him. Made all the more clear as the last thing Caesar did before passing on was leave his remaining life force to Jojo, much like his grandpa did all those years ago for Jonathan. And if I'm being honest, this fight right here is peak Joseph Joestar. He's cunning, he's confident, and he looks damn good. Look at the scarf and Hachimaki. And this outing he has against Wham demonstrates just that, implementing everything that made all the prior fights with him so compelling to begin with. It's got some truly stunning visuals, more twists and turns than any other fight presented to us thus far, and really made Joseph feel like some sort of crazy genius. This is the most involved fight in the entire arc of until this point, and one that makes full use of all of Wham's established abilities, with an ending that ties back to its beginning. At the beginning of this battle, Jojo asks quietly to himself that Caesar be with him in this outing. And Jojo, in this final fight, quite literally could not have won if not for what Caesar physically and emotionally left behind. Igniting the fire that consumes the arena, Caesar's Hachimaki envelops Wham, acting as the emotional high point and my personal favorite part of this spectacular fight, encapsulating everything I love about Jojo, its style, humor, creativity, and heart. So, uh, Lisa Lisa lost, and now Cars is about to take over the world, and there are vampires everywhere. Okay, didn't expect that at all. Don't even know how they managed to find them seeing as everyone who knew where they were has either died or is knocked out. And I guess Araki didn't know either because he moves on from the scene almost immediately. Seriously, uh, Stroheim shows up and Jojo's battle with Cars begins like two pages later, but who cares? Vampire Squirrel! To be perfectly frank, while I thought the scope of this fight was fittingly larger than all of the others and it employed elements seldom seen in the series like vampire animals coming out of everywhere, I don't think I enjoyed this fight with Cars nearly as much as I did the fight with Wham. For one simple reason, emotional significance. 
The bond I recognized between Caesar and Jojo was far greater and for me acted as the emotional climax of this story. This just felt like a more extravagant second act to me. Though I did still really like it, despite it having a rather contrived ending in the volcano suddenly going off, thus winning Jojo the bout. Despite this, I do recognize the subversion in the only fight Jojo wins without his one step ahead type thinking is the final boss fight of the arc, and he loses his arm too, so that's nuts. So in a way, I can see the method behind this madness, however it just didn't gel as well as the prior fight with Wham did for me really. But that is a small nitpick in a story that honestly fills me with so much joy and excitement from beginning to end, punctuated beautifully by Jojo's sudden arrival at his own funeral at the very end. There's a fantastic sense of friendship and community in this, and it really felt 100% distinct from Jonathan's story from the arc prior. In my opinion, this was a massive improvement in the right direction, and I can't wait to finally cover some material next week that I've never been exposed to before. Because, truth be told, Stardust Crusaders is a total- yeah. Like a bloody song